Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship with the First Congregational Church of Great Barrington, United Church of Christ, on this beautiful summer morning. It's good to have each and every one of you here with us today. Just a couple of very brief announcements. Uh, first off, just a, a little explanation once again. Uh, communion uh, liturgy is in the bulletin. Uh, when we serve communion, the way we're going to continue to do it for the time being is we'll do the liturgy during the service, and then after the benediction, during the postlude, I will uh, spirit myself around to the front of the church and will be greeting you as you exit um, to offer you the elements of communion out there as you leave. And once again, we're using the... Uh, snack pack, as I call it. Uh, it has the wafer on the top, you peel that back to get to the wafer, and then you peel the second layer off that gets you to the uh, juice, which is um, currently chilled, but it's also shelf stable. So just a nice, neat, sanitary way of um, doing communion in this time. Uh, the other announcement that I wanna highlight is that I will be away this week uh, visiting family out of state, and so in my absence next Sunday, our uh, lay leader, Bill Bowden, will be leading service and offering a message, uh, which sounds like it'll be wonderful. And um, if you have any urgent pastoral care needs uh, during this week, if, if you become ill or are hospitalized or um, if there's a, a death, please call Bill and he will get you in touch, get you connected with the um, emergency pastor that is filling in for me. Um, so there is pastoral care available if you do have an urgent matter this week. Call Bill and he'll put you in touch with someone. I believe those are all the announcements that I have at this time. So I invite you to join with me in preparing our hearts and our minds for worship as we join responsibly in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We are hungry for the bread of heaven. Jesus said, the bread of life gives light to the world. We are hungry for eternal life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We are here to become the Lord of God, the body of Christ, who for our hungry world. I invite you to join with me in a spirit of prayer. God of forgiveness and new beginnings, you feed our hearts with compassion and nourish our souls with the bread of heaven. As we are filled with your generous spirit, may we grow and mature in faith. As your children, may we exhibit a maturity of faith like that of your son, uniting all variety of gifts and service into one body. In glory to you. Amen. Uh, one correction on the opening hymn this morning, it is in the New Century Hymnal number 386, 386, The Church's One Foundation.
When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I assure you that you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate all the food you wanted. Don't work for the food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the human one will give you. God the Father has confirmed him as his agent to give life. They asked, what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? Jesus replied, this is what God requires, that you believe in him whom God sent. They said, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives you life to the world. They said, Sir, give us this bread all the time. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Our epistle reading for today is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. And this is the Common English Bible translation. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love, and make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one Spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. God has given his grace to each one of us measured out by the gift that is given by Christ. That is why scripture says, when he climbed up to the heights, he captured prisoners and he gave gifts to people. What does the phrase, he climbed up, mean? If it doesn't mean that he had first gone down into the lower regions, the earth. The one who went down is the same one who climbed up above all the heavens so that he might fill everything. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. His purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's love. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are not supposed to be infants any longer who can be tossed and blown around by every wind that comes from teaching with deceitful scheming and the tricks people play to deliberately mislead others. Instead, by speaking the truth with love, let's grow in every way with Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from him as it is joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with love as each one does its part. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What does it mean to be a Christian? What are the expectations of one who is part of God's family, the church? This is the direction the author of Ephesians turns in today's reading. 
For the first three chapters of Ephesians, purportedly a letter to Christians in the region of Ephesus, by Paul or a follower of Paul, it outlines all that God has done for creation, for humanity, and for us. As Brian Peterson explains in his commentary for Working Preacher, then the first verse of chapter 4 is a major hinge in this letter. The author turns from describing all that God has done to consider what is a fitting response. The therefore that begins the passage is the beginning of an extended section outlining what a moral life lived in response to God's activity should look like. Central to this passage is the idea of unity. The sevenfold oneness is no accident of the pen. The number seven is understood as a number that represents completeness or wholeness. Sometimes it can even be understood as perfection. But this emphasis on one is not at all about individuality. You, plural, it says, are one body, one spirit, called in one hope, with one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and all this is rooted in the one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Yes, we have an extended Three Musketeers vibe going on here. The all of us exists in the oneness of God, and the allness of God is what makes us one. The gifts described here in Ephesians may seem unfamiliar in comparison to the gifts of the Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians 12. But it's here in Ephesians that Paul lifts up the gifts of leaders who exist in order to equip and build up the body of Christ, meaning the church. Notice what this is saying in verses 11 through 16. Paul is explaining that the purpose of church leaders, of pastors and prophets and teachers, their role is to equip God's people so that the people of God can grow up, so that they can become mature adults in the manner of Christ. Now, that's a very different way of thinking about the role of pastors and of thinking about church growth than what we are accustomed. Typically, when we talk about church growth, it tends to revolve around numbers. Better attendance, more members, bigger budgets, greater income. But that's not the growth Paul is referring to. The church doesn't need to focus on getting wider or fatter. It needs to go deeper. As alluded to in the preceding chapter, Paul is saying that growth is about becoming rooted and nourished, growing stronger in faith, not in portfolios and bank account numbers. Thinking this way requires a reorientation of our lives, a moving away from a consumerist approach to church that focuses on what we get and what the pastor should give us, and instead emphasizes what we give one another and how we continue to grow. Part of this growth includes coming to an understanding that unity is not uniformity. This requires us to learn differentiation, that others can be and do in ways that I am not or would not. In addition to the themes of unity and maturity, there's an emphasis on love in this chapter, as the image of the church as the body of Christ is bracketed by love in verses 15 and 16. Love is what makes unity in diversity possible. When we study the Gospels, when we read those books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we see in the actions of Jesus is one who's always 
seeking to be inclusive. Someone who draws outsiders in. Someone who looks to make what was broken whole. In fact, it's fascinating when you look and see when Jesus does speak words of condemnation, it is almost exclusively in response to those who sought to exclude, condemn, or judge others. Overwhelmingly, through his words and actions, Jesus teaches us that we are to be loving and to be welcoming to others, particularly to those who've been marginalized or cast out, who've been hurt by us in the past. Part of maturity is recognizing that what is best for the whole may not be what we personally would choose for ourselves. But we have this tendency to want things tied up night and nice and neat with little bows. We want there to be no ambiguity. But if you consider the image of the body of Christ, we realize that though we do need ties that bind, they must have elasticity. Just as there becomes pain in our physical bodies when our muscles or ligaments become too tight, so too in the church, when we become too rigid, too unyielding, too judgmental, we become all tied up in knots. We can't move. We die. As people of faith, we are all called to a calling as God's people. We are called, not demanded, not ordered, but called, invited. As recipients of God's love and Christ's grace, we have received. Being members of the church, the body of Christ, we have answered that call. We've picked up the phone. But now, now we must continue the conversation. We must go beyond receivers and become conversation partners, growing in wisdom and maturity, learning from those gifted with the spirits of, and gifts of prophecy and evangelism. I know that word makes us uncomfortable. All it means is being a messenger to the good news. Gifts of teaching and pastoring. Just this last week, I was in conversation with someone who was recounting to me some difficulties that they'd had with children who were being extremely demanding. The person had to explain to the children that it is babies who demand things, but that when you grow up, it means that you have to learn to help out and to interact in a loving manner with others. This is the work of community. It's the work of differentiation, to move from expecting our demands to be met to questioning ourselves. What gifts do I bring to the table? How can I contribute and build up the good of the church and its mission? When Paul speaks of us as babies, he is speaking of the ways in which we are reactive. The ways in which we grab on to whatever connects with what we already think. It's a life focused on what we get. But being mature in faith, grown-ups in the church, if you will, means being able to see from another perspective. Contributing rather than commanding. Because we strive for unity rather than uniformity, because the body is connected with ligaments that allow for movement and flexibility, there will necessarily be tensions at times. Conflicts will arise. But as one of the workshops at General Synod this year made abundantly clear, conflict is not bad. Conflict is not bad. It's a sign of growth and movement. The problem is when people use conflict to create division. As Brian Peterson observed, when we experience division in the church, 
We need to realize that we are getting the very thing that we have truly desired the most, being right in our own eyes. Not bothering to learn how to love those who are genuinely different. Now, a final word about the opening verse that sums up this passage. Our English translation says that we are to live as people worthy of the call we received from God. Now, in Greek, that word translated as worthy is axios. When we hear worthy, we might be thinking of deserving, as though somehow we must have earned it. But the word axios, which is actually an economic term that describes two equal sides of a scale, this word axios here, to live axios of the call, means really to live in, in equilibrium, in balance to God's call. In other words, because of the great love with which God loves us in response to that amazing grace given to us, we are to live in a way that is in measure to what we have received. Now, as you and I know, we can never give back to God all that we have received. There's no way. Thus, it is then to be, that to be a Christian is to live one's entire life in thanksgiving, striving to grow and mature in faith, following in the way of Christ. A life that is loving, welcoming, and unifying. It's never something that's just done. It's ongoing. As Martin Luther once wrote, this life, therefore, is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. Not health, but getting well. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not now what we shall be, but we are on the way. The process is not yet finished, but it is actively going on. This is not the goal, but it is the right road. At present, everything does not gleam and sparkle, but everything is being cleansed. Martin Luther seems to be on to something there. This siblings in Christ is indeed the good news, that God is not finished with us yet that we are still growing and becoming and maturing. We have not arrived, but we are on the way. We see but dimly, but someday we will see clearly and know fully. And may God's grace and peace go with us as we live and grow abounding in love. Amen. Uh, one correction to the bulletin there. Um, it's not quite yet time for the Sacrament of Holy Communion. We're moving that down. That's actually at the end of the service, just before the last hymn. So I'm going to just give David a minute or two there um, to get ready. And then we will be singing our hymn of response, number 397 in the New Century Hymnal. Thank our God for sisters, brothers.
I invite you to join with me in a spirit of prayer. God of love, we are wayfarers in the world, prone to erratic changes, of course, to losing sight of our goals, to becoming so discouraged by the journey that we'll hitch a ride on anything that comes along. Help us on our way, O oh God. If we change our course, let it be not in self-interest, but in order to share the love of Christ with another traveler. If we lose sight of our goals, then let our quest bring us as your curious people to honest searching of our faith, to the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge that grounds us deeper in you. If we become weary and discouraged and forget that you are with us, then let it lead to a recognition of our need for you to rely on your strength, your guidance, guidance, your power. As we travel in a world that seems to be a trackless and hostile wilderness, we ask that your spirit go with us to sustain us, to encourage us, to enable us to go on. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who walked before us, taught us, and continues to teach us. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us now into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite you to turn in your bulletins to the, um, I don't know, cream-colored insert, perhaps? Uh, for the Liturgy for Communion. The table is open to all who confess Jesus as the Christ and who seek to live and follow in Christ's way. Come to the sacred table not because you must, but because you may. Come not because you are fulfilled, but because in your emptiness you stand in need of God's mercy and assurance. Come not to an express an opinion, but to seek a presence and to pray for a spirit. Come to the table then, siblings in Christ, just as you are. Partake and share. It is spread for you and for me that we might again know that God has come to us, has shared in our common lot, and has invited us to join the people of God's new age. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, we praise and we bless you for creation and for the gift of life and for your abiding love which brings us closer to you, the source of all blessing. We thank you for revealing your will for us in the giving of the law and in the preaching of your prophets. We thank you especially that in the fullness of time you sent Jesus, born of Mary, 
to live in our midst, to share in our suffering, to accept the pain of death at the hands of those whom Jesus loved. We rejoice that in a perfect victory over the grave, you raised Christ with power to become sovereign in your realm. We celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to gather your church and by which your work may be done in the world and through which we share in the gift of eternal life. So it is with the faithful in every place and time that we praise with joy your holy name. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. Consecrate, therefore, by your Holy Spirit, O God, these gifts of bread and of wine, and bless us that as we receive them at this table, we may offer you our faith and our praise. We may be united with Christ and with one another, and we may continue faithful in all things. In the strength Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, eternal God, and give thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. The cup of blessing shed for you. Once again, as we depart following the benediction, uh, you'll be receiving the elements as you take your leave. So then let us share in the prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your praise in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 349 in the New Century Hymnal, I come with joy. <laughs>
the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, so that it gives light to all in the house. So may your light shine before all people, so that they may see your good works and give glory to God who is in heaven. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen.